Thank everyone for being here. I'm Dave Stewart, Athletic Director with the club. Um, and you know, we're doing these Parenting for Success series because we know that, that all of you are the most influential people in your kids' lives. And you know, our goal is to develop great people through our programs, through sport. So um, pursuant to that, we bring in people um, who have a great vision for, for the role that sport can play in life. And John O'Sullivan is one of those people. He founded the Changing the Game um, uh, project in 2012 um, with the mission to kind of return youth sports uh, to the kids, right? And make it truly athlete centered and not about professionalism and about the club and about, about the kid. And since then, he's been on a, on a tear, you know, writing books about um, optimal uh, practices for, for youth sports and, and for parenting um, athletes in youth sports as well. Um, and he's uh, worked with many different organizations, uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, USA Swimming, USA Rugby, um, as well as NCAA teams and clubs across a variety of sports. So there's a ton of experience um, with this. He's also um, arranged and held a, co a coaches conference um, that's in Denver that brings in coaches from across the country and around the world, across a wide variety of sports that we participated in. Um, teaching best practices in sport and, sh and sharing that, that mission that, that John is, and his um, his uh, his you know, partner in this in this message Jerry Lynch with our coaches. Um, a lot of our coaches have gone to that. We've gone every year with a group of five to eight coaches. So the message that John has about youth youth sports is part of our club. So he's part of our success, and, and we're proud of that. Um, and you know, I think that. There's like, this message is so important, I think, and we want to push this out as much as we can, uh, not just through through our coaches and through the conference, but also by bringing John here to speak to you directly. Um, and uh, really just appreciate having you all here to hear this and to get on the same page where we're at as a club, the message that John has, and hopefully um, the way that our coaches are working with your kids every day. So I'll stop talking and let John take it away. Thank you so much, Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, this is when you're like, supposed to clap and make me feel good. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's so fantastic to be back in Steamboat. And I had a wonderful day yesterday with the, uh, with the full-time staff, a couple hours in the morning, and then with uh, a lot of the part-time staff or people who hold other jobs yesterday evening. Um, and then to get to talk to all of you tonight and record it. and get this message out is, uh, it, it's so awesome. I, I love it here. I said to a couple of you who arrived early, um, I work with a lot of different ski academies um, around the country and around the world, and um, I, I think what you do here in Steve is really special. The investment that this club makes in its coaching staff and its parents and just trying to always be at the forefront of what's next, what's new. Uh, I think it's, it's really special. And so I love, I truly love um, coming back here and everything like that. So um, because we have this size group, I, I would love to make this very conversational as well. So as I'm talking, I don't wanna just talk at you for an hour, like please ask questions. Um, and I put some stuff up here, if I get through it, great. If I skip around, great. Um, but this is what I love to do. But I want to tell you sort of my uh, origin story um, because it started with, with these guys. These were the mighty unicorns, right? <laughs> uh, and this is my daughter's, uh, you know, six-year-old soccer team. And, and this, is my, this is my daughter right there. And, and for those of you in the ski racing world who just can't get enough skiing and so you watch it on TV, that's Steve Perino's daughter right there in yeah. Greece. So, um, so you know, the, so I was at the Mighty Unicorn six-year-old soccer game, right? And you've all been like, who's been to a six-year-old soccer game, right? <laughs> you know, so there's like the giant blob of kids, <laughs> and they trample each other, and sometimes they score the wrong goal, and they will be excited. Um, and so I'm watching the unicorns play, and it's just great, and all the parents are positive, and the coaches are positive, and they don't even have referees at that age, and I'm thinking, this is awesome, like, this is what sport's supposed to be about. Kids are constantly failing, but no one's yelling at them, right? Just like when our kids are learning to walk, we're not like, get up, do it again, you know, like they're supposed to fall down, right? Um, but then right next door to the unicorns game, there's a 10-year-old boy's soccer game, and it's a competitive soccer game. And it's not the kids competing harder, it's all the adults competing harder. Right? And I'm 
watching that and uh, parents are screaming at the kids and the coaches are screaming at the kids and everyone's yelling at the ref who's like 12. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this is nuts. Is anyone on my field looking at this going, wow, I hope in four years that's what we can do, right? We can spend more time and more money so our kids can have less fun. And that was sort of the day where I was like, maybe I can do something more than just, you know, running this. Because I was like, I was just, at that point, I was like, hmm, like, what a disaster. Who's running this league? And it was me. <laughs> it was my club. And I was like, I gotta do something more. So that's how Change in the Game Project was born. And I, and I wrote my first book for, for parents in sport called Change in the Game. And, um, and, uh, and then I realized that it's actually like, it's not really hard to write a book. It's really hard to sell a book. <laughs> a lot of people know you've written a book. So uh, I started a blog and it led to a TED Talk. And now, as Dave was saying, uh, we have a podcast that we've managed to release, I think, 340 five straight weeks uh, where we've interviewed some of the top coaches in the world from Steve Kerr and Phil Jackson to lacrosse, field hockey, two World Cup winning soccer coaches, professional athletes, sports psychologists, sports scientists, trying to give the latest and greatest best practices of how we can, um, how we can uh, sort of you know, create the right environment. And before I move on this picture, um, it's interesting we're here tonight because um, this picture sort of also represents the beginning of a journey that's come full circle. So I fly home tomorrow morning because on Friday, um, my daughter there um, plays her senior night soccer game, right? And it's going off to college. And I think about when I started this, my kids, I have a son who's a junior in high school, with the beginning of this journey, and I, I, you know, I started, it was selfish. Like, I want to be the best dad I can be for, for my kids as well. And so I've, I've watched them on this journey, and um, my wife and I really approaching it with this idea of, you know, what was, our, what was the purpose of sport in our children's lives, right? And it wasn't, you know, we were both Division I athletes. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was, you know, that we wanted our kids to be surrounded by great mentors and coaches, that we wanted them to learn valuable lessons and, and learn how to struggle and deal with adversity and all these sort of things um, so that they could become better people, right? And, and that's been just a, a super fun um, journey. Um, I coached for so many years before I had my own kids and I, I, like, I feel really bad about maybe some of the way I treated some of the other people's kids before I had my own. <laughs> so maybe this work I do is my penance as well for, for that, okay? So one of the biggest thing I, I think, and, and you know, you're very lucky, like here in this club, you have Luke, you have a sport performance person, a, a mindset person. I, I think one of, the, one of my favorite books is um, this book called The Inner Game of Tennis by a guy named Tim Galway. And he talks about performance is potential minus interference. And, and how our kids perform in, in any achievement activity, it could be school or whatever, is their potential, which is their hours of training, their practice, and their coaching, and their genetics, and all this sort of stuff, minus the things that interfere with. And the biggest thing, like once the, the race starts, once the game starts, performance is 100% mental, mm. right? And, and so I, I realized at some point that my job as a coach and my job as a parent is not always to add on, but what can I strip away? Right? So we're going to start today with a little activity, um, and this is called the, the Stroop Test. And it's a psychological test that was invented in 1935 by this guy, John Ridley Stroop. It's a two-part test. And, um, and what he hypothesized and proved was that when you add cognitive interference, it slows down physical reaction time of a task. Okay? So two-part test, Stroop Test. All right. So part one, out loud, as a room, as fast as we can go, we're going to read all four lines, green, yellow, purple, red, blue, yellow, all the way down to the last purple. Okay? If you're competitive, the record's like eight seconds. <laughs> <laughs> all right? So, out loud as a room, as fast as we can go, um, and then when you're done, just be silent, and I'll stop the clock. Ready? Set. Go. Green, green yellow, yellow, purple, red, blue, yellow, red, yellow, purple, red, blue, red, yellow, red, green, red, yellow, red, green, red, yellow, red, green, red, yellow, purple, blue, red, that was pretty good right there. That was like eight and a half. Who, who, who gave the last purple? Uh, <laughs> did, <You're> just laugh. <laughs> well, did anyone else like when did anyone else have someone like next to them who was like a little bit ahead or behind? Yeah. 
Yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> right? And it distracts you. Right? It distracts you. But overall, it, this is a, yeah. that's a pretty interference-free environment. And we work our way through. Right? Um, here's your test part two. Oh. If you're colorblind, you don't have to do it. Um, <laughs> So, so now instead of reading, this is the same exact words in font, but instead of reading the word, you have to say the color. So you have to say blue, red, green, blue, yellow, blue. Uh, what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to stretch, man? <laughs> right? All right. So this is out loud as a room, as fast as we can go, all four lines down to the last thing. On your marks, get set, go. Blue, red, green, blue, yellow, blue, blue, purple, red. So, so that was not eight and a half seconds, <laughs> right? So I love this because we add a little cognitive interference and all of a sudden it comes to a screeching halt. Now, be honest, raise your hand if you quit. Yeah, all right, perfect, no, right? <laughs> right? So, so I, I feel like a lot of times when our kids are playing sports, right, they feel like this. Certainly when I'm coaching soccer and there's two coaches on one side and 52 on the other, right, that's what they feel like, right? And, but I think interference takes many forms, right? And it can take the form, uh, no one showed up here tonight because you don't love your kids, right? But sometimes we don't love them in the most helpful ways, right? And, and, and so I, I think, you know, sometimes the pressure we put on them or loss of ownership or loss of enjoyment all of a sudden shifts performance, right, from here to, to, to this. And so what I'd like to do tonight is sort of give you some ideas of how you can strip away that interference so your kids can play up to their potential so that in whatever they do, right? And again, this isn't just in skiing or snowboarding, and this is in school, this is in music, this is in theater, this is in all these different things, okay? All right, any questions, any thoughts so far? Any comments? Anyone want a second shot at that? <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right, so um, sort of want, want, want to cover a couple of basic things, right? Why are kids involved, participate in sports? importance of uh, embracing the process and playing the long game, giving your kids ownership and loving watching them compete. Um, we'll kind of jump around. What I didn't think about, Dave, is I have a couple of videos. I don't know how loud they're going to end up turning out, but we'll do our best. It's not a big room. So, yeah. anyway. Um, so, let's start. Why, why do your kids ski? Why do they snowboard? Why do they do what they do? For the snacks. For the snacks, yeah, that's quite part of it, for sure. Right? That's the only question that's ever occurred to my son after a game, where's the food? <laughs> right? Social. Social. Why else? They're passionate about the sport. Passionate, love the sport. To be Fun. active. Be active. Fun. 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 This is what kids say, right, um, when they're asked, why do you participate in sports? Because it's fun, right? And I think we have a huge problem in the world of sport, that sport can either be competitive or it can be fun. But actually, it needs to be both. Uh, I, I remember the, the first time we ever talked, my, my business partner works very closely with, you, uh, with uh, Steve Kerr at Golden State, um, and um, we, we talked about, you know, what's the number one core value of the Golden State Warriors? And it's joy, right? So here they are winning world championship professional basketball, and it's joy. And I remember we were we did a chat with him from his office, um, you know, a year and a half ago. And he's sitting in his office and writing the whiteboard. It has the Warriors' core values and it's joy, right? And it's competitiveness because we want to win a championship, right? And it's compassion because we need to treat each other well and be a family. And then it's mindfulness and those are their values. But number one is joy. And he's like, and usually when we're not doing well, it's because we lose the joy. Right? And this is so important. So what is fun for kids? This is what's really interesting. Um, what makes it fun? And so this woman named Amanda Visick from George Washington University did this research. She asked children, well, why do you, why do you play sports? Because uh, it's fun. Well, define fun. And kids came up with 81 characteristics of fun. Right? Um, find your best. 
right? Being treated with respect, God forbid, right? Participating in competition, positive team dynamics, exercising and being active. Those are the top five drivers of fun. Now, I think this is really important for those of us whose kids participate in individual sports. Team dynamics still matter, right? I don't care if your kid's a skier or a swimmer, right? Uh, positive team dynamics, team culture matters so much. Remember one of my first um, ski, uh, ski clubs I worked with, the Ski Club Vail, and I was doing a talk for their coach education, and the guy following me was a guy named Christian Mitter, who at the time was the Norwegian Alpine men's coach. And I was so curious, what, is, what was he going to talk about? And his, his talk was, called, was culture comes first is that the positive team dynamics come first because if we um, create the right type of culture and we treat each other well and people eat well and they sleep well and they look out for each other off the snow and practices are better and um, everything's better because of that. So even though that on the race it might be your kid, everything that goes into that race right, is about team dynamics, right? So this is really important. Now further down the list, right, number 48 was winning. I've never coached a game where there was 47 things more important than winning. <laughs> never once. But apparently for kids, you know, that's, that's the case a lot. And I remember my, my daughter, her name is Maggie, by the way. Um, I remember Maggie's first, like, travel soccer tournament. I went to Portland, Oregon um, for this tournament. And I'm sitting on the sideline, just a dad, I'm not coaching, I'm watching the game, and they lose, like, 10-0. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this game, and I'm thinking, my, my poor daughter, like, because I'm embarrassed. And I'm angry. What am I going to say? I got to be a good dad after this. And so the game ends, and her and her teammates are walking over. And I walk up to her. I'm like, "Hey, Mag, how you doing?" She goes, "Dad, the hotel has a pool." <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Let's go swim. All right. Now, I'm not saying this is for everybody. Who who has show show hands? Who has a, a, a child in here with that when they don't win, they're just fired up, right? Yeah, so we have lots of people who are really competitive. So I don't think that that um, when someone right has that drive that we want to beat it out of them, but we want it to be a, a healthy competitiveness. There's no way you're going to win every race. There's no way you're going to win every competition. Right? Losing is 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 part of the journey, right? And so these kids who who sometimes get really fixated on, I, I lost, well, what's behind that? Is it, is it this fixed mindset versus a growth mindset? My abilities are fixed, so if I lose, I don't have it, I'm not good, right? Is it fear of disappointing someone? Um, is it just, I mean, I, I was a super competitive athlete. I, I hated losing so much, but I felt like I had a healthy perspective that this was, that this was part of the process, right? So I'm not saying that if your kid you know, that you go home and say, you know, there's 47 things more important than winning every time, right? Like, we want them to try hard. We want them to give their very best effort. But, you know, you know, you can win everything if you want. You can just, you know, be a big fish in a small pond. But when your kid moves on and moves on to the next level and the pond gets bigger, then losing races, losing competitions, that's, that's part of it. That's just part of the journey, right? And so that's what we have to teach our kids. They, they need reps in losing. Right? They need reps in adversity and failure. And, and one of the biggest things that we can do as parents is not steal those reps. Right? We don't want to steal those reps. Okay? Um, be patient with your kids. I put this picture up because all of the boys are 12. <laughs> right? They're all 12. A 12-year-old boy can have a developmental age swing of 5 or 6 years. It means you have a body of a 10-year-old and a body of a 15-year-old, right? Who's ever watched, like, the Little League World Series, right? Yeah. Little League World Series, right? Every year there's, like, this kid, what a pitcher, what a player. I'm like, he has a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> right? So all these boys are 12, and so we have to be patient. Um, now... You know, depending on the sport that your kid's involved in, there's a th and, and this is, it goes for school as well, there's a thing called relative age. And what relative age is, is where is your child born compared to the arbitrary calendar cutoff date for their sport, right? So, like my daughter in, in soccer, 
January 1's the cutoff date, right? My daughter was born in December. She was always the smallest, right? Always one of the youngest, grade behind, all this sort of stuff. Um, and so, uh, and, and they do this in schools too, right? And you think about that, right? Someone who's born in December versus January in, in a, you know, in uh, a sport, right? At eight years old, when we're making selections, when we're quote identifying talent, that's 15% of their life, right? It's a huge difference, right? Anyone have kids who are like one grade apart? Right? Like I do, and it's crazy how different they were, right? When you see them like, wow, I can't believe you're only one grade behind, or my kids are 18 months apart, right? And so we, we have to be patient. And, and there, there was this really interesting study that came out, sort of an amalgamation of all these other studies uh, recently, that found um, that only 7% of elite junior performers across a variety of sports, from tennis to to hockey, to soccer, everything, were considered elite performers at, senior, at the senior level. Only 7%, right? So we put so much into, wow, look how good my kid is at 10 or 11 or 12, but it's one of the poorest indicators of where they'll be later on, right? What our good indicators are their love and their ownership of the sport, their intrinsic motivation to get, get better, uh, character, coachability, things like that, grit, resilience, those are really good indicators. Um, much more so than how do they do when they're 10 in their race. Because they could just have a 15 year old's hours of practice. They could have a 15 year old's body. They could have all these different things, right? And there's so many stories of this. I mean, I think one of the best examples, right, just the, uh, American football, right? Tom Brady, you know, maybe the greatest player of all time. And, where they draft 162 players in front of him, right? And he was 23, right? So if we can't identify, the NFL can't spend millions of dollars to identify talent at age 23, who thinks they can do it at eight or nine, right? I, I tell organizations all the time, um, let me go into your club and tryouts, and you pick the best the best players, and just give me the list of birthdays, and I'll pick the 16 oldest, and I bet you I get 85% of it right. <laughs> right? That's how much of a difference this makes. But once the kids hit puberty and stuff, it starts to change. Now, what there's also really interesting evidence is the difference in puberty for boys and girls. Right? So what happens when a, when a boy hits puberty? Right? They grow fast, muscle mass. They tend to do this. What happens to girls? They plateau. They often plateau anywhere from six months to three years. And they do this, and then they do this again, if we can be patient with them. Right? So there's a lot of emerging research in this area that the way that we coach girls through this time when their body changes so much is so important from a, a social, emotional, cognitive standpoint to just being patient with their development. It's not that they don't care. And so that's why what happens, so many girls quit at sort of age 12, 13, 14. Because they, they feel like they stop getting better. And the coaches are like, you used to be so good and now you're not, right? But they're trying to, <laughs> but they're trying to figure out how to, how to function with a completely different body, right? So this is really important. Um, I do have a video, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, um, but just because I like this video, um, this is uh, a quote nine-year-old playing rugby. Oh <laughs> close enough to him so that their dad won't yell at him, but they're like, I have no way I'm tackling him. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? So we have to, we have to embrace, the, embrace the process of growth. Every, every kid is different. Every kid's on their, um, their own path. 
And I think one of the biggest mistakes, um, this guy, Dr. Stephen Norris, said to me once on the podcast, he said, um, kids like to compete and parents like to compare. And one of the most important things is we don't compare our child on their path to anyone else's because they're just completely different, right? And anyone who has two kids know, like, are your kids completely different? Yeah. It's like you ate the same food, same parents, grew up in the same house, and you're not at all alike, so why would my kid be on the same path as someone else's? Right? So if you have one of those early developers, right, who is having a lot of success early on because they're bigger, faster, stronger, more hours, whatever, it's really important to just, um, you know, teach them about the importance of, you know, being teachable, about being resilient, right? In a lot of sports, we want those kids to play up an age group to compete against older people so that they can't get away with being bigger, stronger, faster, and they have to develop game intelligence and things like that. And then, if you have someone who's a late bloomer, right, well, what do you control? You don't control when you grow, right? But you control your attitude, your work ethic, uh, your, your development, your hours of practice. That all belongs to you. And you will grow, it really grows, right? So, super important. Any questions on any of this? Throwing a lot out at you. Yeah? I'm just curious, you just mentioned uh, somebody that's an early bloomer or having success at a young age because they're bigger than everybody else. And you mentioned moving up in an age class. Mm -hmm. Do you feel good about that? What are your thoughts on doing that? that yeah, a, a so I, I, I think it's, I think, I think that's something that is a decision has to be made on an individual level, right? Um, because, right, we, I mean, again, we have, you know, we just had a 13 year old boy in the US sign a pro soccer contract, right? So, um, you know, there's this, uh, if he's good enough, he's old enough from a soccer standpoint, but what about maturity-wise, right? And so you have to make that decision. Now, in the, in the winter sports world, where sometimes, you know, someone's young and they're competing at that level, but they're, right, you know, you think about all the time that they're traveling and spending with kids who are much more emotionally mature than them, you know, that's, that, those are the things, we, we're weighing all those different things, right, uh, of how do we do that. So, I think it depends on the sport, I think it depends on the kid, are they ready for it, do they want to do this, um, and, and then the, the ability to do it, you know. I went to the same high school in Long Island as a guy named Mark Pulisic, and his son Christian is a pretty good soccer player. Um, and, and, you know, Christian you know, at 12 was on the under 14 U.S. national team, and I was like, you need to go to Europe, and Christian didn't want to go. And what Mark and Kelly said to me is like, they're like, their biggest thing that they did as parents oftentimes for Christian was say no. No to great opportunities, because they wanted him to also be a kid. So, what a great opportunity to go play for this team and do this thing, thank you coach, sounds awesome, but he's gonna stay home and play basketball with his friends this weekend. And then they said, finally at 15, Christian came to them and said, I'm ready, I want to go to Europe, right? And his dad went with them and they moved to Germany and he said they, they, they got there and they cleared off the wall and they wrote on the wall, no excuses. And Mark said to him, he's like, this is your dream. This is your thing. I'm here with you, I'm gonna support you, but there's gonna be, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna get benched, you're gonna have bad moments, you're gonna have bad coaches, no excuses. And when you want to go home, we'll go home. Right? You can go home, right? But it's always, it's your decision, and I'm gonna support you in this. And I think Christian's had a, an incredible career with a ton of adversity, but built a lot of strength because his parents let him own it over time. And early on, it wasn't more, 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 it was less, less, less. <coughs> yeah, but everyone's different. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah? So I, I would start, I, I would recommend a, a wonderful book by a runner named Lauren Fleshman. It's called Good for a Girl. Um, it just came out. She's from, she lives in Bend. Um, she was a professional runner, a Stanford runner. and um, she, She's a great writer. It's a super interesting book. And we did a podcast with her as well. So uh, you can find that interview. But, but she talks a lot about this. And, and what's 
what's happened in, in sports science is most of the research has been done on boys, right? Because with girls, you know, we, we have, you know, you have like the menstrual cycle and things like that that really throw off results at different times, right? And so what, they, what they've said is like, uh, so they just said, ah, we're just not gonna, you know, do that research and we'll just treat boys and girls the same, but they're not the same. And anyone who coaches knows they're not the same and anyone who's raised a girl knows it's not the same. And so um, I, I think it's just recognizing, and, and it probably depends on the sport too, right? The reason that the world's best gymnasts and figure skaters are so small and little is because the, the ability to do all the spins and things like that has to be developed prior to when they grow, right? And so, um, but it didn't used to be like that, right? That was like Nadia Komanich in the 1976 Olympics. Before that, all the female gymnasts were 28 and then all of a sudden they were 12, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it depends on the sport and it just it depends on growth and how they develop. Um, but it, it's just it's so critical to just, I, I think, just be patient, right? Like just, um, and, and, and I think that's when the emotional support of a parent and of a coach to say, hey, what's happening to you right now is normal. This is okay, right? Go through this and you're gonna be fine and come out the back end and you're gonna be okay, right? So, I, you know, with my daughter who was the 33rd tallest out of 34 kids, mm -hmm. I had to be like, it's okay. You're, you know, guess what, dad's tall, you're gonna grow. And, and it was funny when she all of a sudden, like sophomore year of high school, she grew and she got very strong and it was like, wow, she's, Maggie got so good. I'm like, no, she actually just grew. She's not like <laughs> a little girl anymore playing against women who grew at 12 and won't grow anymore ever again, right? And so, yeah, so it was really, but I had to just encourage her, it's okay to be on the B team. It's, you just want to get playing time. You want to do things like that. So, yeah. Any thoughts, questions? You know, I think uh, one of the things we talk about embracing the process, um, Let's have this other video here. I'm gonna, let me just, I'm gonna hit escape and, and crank up my volume and see what that gets me. Um, uh, oh, it's not letting me out. All right. So, let me see if I can do this. Um, embracing the process, this, this, is, this is the process of one of the best people in the world at a sport, a professional skateboarder learning a new trick. someone pulling the trick or whatever and it was just cool like Dave and I were standing out there before and I'm watching I don't know if any of your kids are the ski jumpers and I'm just thinking how impressive that was right and I'm just like oh my goodness they don't start on the big hill right they work their way up to it right and and uh, but I think a, a lot of kids they they see this amazing trick or they see messy or whatever and they say I want to do that 
But I don't want to do anything to get to there. I just want to be that, right? And so again, this is where our adult perspective can help them of embrace the process, just get better, things like that, okay? All right, um, so other things. Um, in, in my book, Change the Game, I talk about like creating the right, I talk about the seven C's for a high performing state of mind, and that's giving your kids control and ownership, um, the, creating the right conditions, good communication, caring and unconditional love, competence, confidence, um, things like that. And one of the um, biggest things is the right conditions. Now, um, one of the most important places that we can do this um, is the ride home and not making it a teachable moment, right? Because right, they're, they're, so, they're, they're physically, they're emotionally exhausted and yet we got them locked in the car and we're gonna make it a teachable moment, right? <laughs> And what our kids tell us over and over and over is that maybe this is the least teachable moment out there, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, every kid's different. My, my daughter, oh, she gets in the car and she says, Dad, um, how did I do today, right? And like I said before, my son says, where's the food, right? <laughs> and that's it. Um, and and this, it's super interesting because um, that there's actually research on this that when we don't take into our account our, our, the child's state of mind, the car, can, the car ride home can feel like a prison. Right? And so there's this uh, documentary from HBO called Trophy Kids. Anyone seen this? This is probably 10 years old now. Um, but this is actual documentary footage of, of the ride home. Hopefully you can, hopefully you can hear this. Did you tell the coach to put yourself in game? Yeah. How many times? Right next to you. Are you sure? Because I stood right next to you. I tried to find him when he talked about You're not getting it done. Let me explain something to you. If you do something wrong, do I tell you? Yeah. Okay, I correct it. Or I tell you so you can correct it. How do you know what to correct if you don't even know why he pulled you out of the game? What did I tell you about that? What, are you scared of him or something? No. So why don't you go ask him? Like right now, you know we're going to have this conversation after the game. <laughs> you know what's coming. Hey, this is part of you becoming a young man. If someone does something, you're just going to take it? So if I was walking to you and just slap you inside your face, what are you going to do? Just turn around and be like, I don't know why that guy did that. It doesn't make any sense to me. You act like you're 10 or 9 or 8. You're just going through the motions. If you're going to be selfish, you know what? You have other brothers and sisters. And we'll take you from out of that school and give them a chance and put them in a private school. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. It confuses me. What's the problem? Every time I got back in the car, I was in a uh, trouble or did something wrong. Well, did you? Yeah. You've had more personal training than any of those kids out there. Okay. Back to the drum board. Back up to get early, back up inside the morning. Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense. You have to be driving back and forth from this school. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for you to go out and do absolutely nothing. Now, I don't understand why you don't get it. I don't understand it. So I think you can still find trophy kids online. It might not surprise you at the end of this that he quits football, right? He also moves out, his parents were divorced, moves out from his dad. So I put this clip on our Facebook page uh, many years ago, and there was this back and forth, and some people were saying, you know what, that dad's making a big sacrifice, and he just has high standards for his kid. And he's right, that's right. But when, as, as the kid says there, like, I feel like every time I get in the car, I've done something wrong. The car ride home is a prison for this kid, and he's going to quit. Right? So we post this on our Facebook page, and all these comments come back and forth, uh, some positive, some negative, and then this guy writes in, he goes, I was the cameraman. <laughs> so he's sitting in the front seat, and he said, you know, here's the backstory: the, the dad was a football player, got drafted in the NFL, got in trouble, didn't make it, so his son was going to make it on his behalf. But the problem was his son didn't want to make it. 
He didn't own it. He had lost the experience and he was just getting berated every time he got in the car over and over and over. So what I say is like, like I said, my daughter always asks. So when my daughter asks, I, I approach it. If she had the best game ever or the worst game ever, I say the same three things. What went well today? Right? Dad, how'd I do? Well, what went well for you? Well, this and this. What needs work? What didn't go so well? Right? And uh, what can you work on in practice this week so it gets better? And a very consistent approach. What went well? What needs work? What can we work on in practice? Regardless of performance, makes that consistent. My son, right, um, he, he has, you know, like, he, he doesn't ask, but we sort of have this agreement. Maybe that night or maybe the next day, we'll, we'll talk about it. But knowing your own emotional state and, and how you feel about it, it is so important, right? So are you capable of having a conversation? As a coach, I think about this all the time. Am I capable of giving good feedback at the end of the game? Or no, should I wait until the hotel? Should I wait until the next practice? Right? This is all super important. Like so, because you're so upset sometimes. that you're going to like yell? Yeah, maybe. Oh. Right? Yeah, maybe. So, so perfect example, the other day, my son's a junior in high school. His team had uh, a terrible game, and he had a really poor game. He's been having a good season, right? And, and I, I was just disappointed in him, not because they lost, but because I didn't think he really competed hard. And so, you know, that night, there, you know, it was a late game. He has dinner. He's like, hey, Dad, you want to talk about the game? And I was like... You know, teacher, I think we should probably just wait till tomorrow. You're tired. You don't feel good. I don't feel good about it. And then the next day, we had a really good conversation about it, right? Um, so, so knowing yourself and knowing that. Now, I'm not perfect. My kids have been in tears in the car because I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, but then, you know, you mess up, you, you tidy up, right? Because if this, if that car ride home can just be a space for them to unwind and everything, um, and I know, like, I've worked with a lot of ski academies who are like, how do I deal with parents who are standing at the bottom of the race, dissecting everything, whatever, and then the kids get back up and they're in tears on the chairlift going back up because of what mom and dad said. How am I supposed to coach them through that? Mm -hmm. And you really can't, right? So, so recognizing when is a good time, what is their state, when, what, when's the teachable moment? Because if you wait for the right moment and you know what you're talking about, it will listen. Right? But if you think the wrong moment, doesn't matter how much you know, they probably won't. Right? Or they might because they'll comply and they'll eventually resent you for it. Okay? Thoughts, questions on that? Yeah? I, I think that's the most challenging thing for me as a parent is that knowing when your kid has more potential and you see them and they didn't have a great game. And what further is challenging is when you ask them, well, how did you think the game went? Yeah. And they say, oh, I think I played great. Yeah. <laughs> and then you then have to just sort of be like, okay, okay. And I think for me, what I've had to learn is that my child's biggest struggle is confidence. Yeah. And, and shifting that is hard as a parent when you know what they're capable of and they're athletic. And to be like, I just need to build my kids' confidence. Yeah. And I just think that's the hardest thing. I think it's hard when they don't have good self-awareness yeah. of when they're played well. And I think hopefully that comes with maturity, but I'm just kind of, that, that was a lot of talking. But. Yeah, no, no, I, mean, I think it's a really good point, right? And I think in this day and age where a lot of things are videoed, like, well, let's go through the video and, and go through, you know, and, and see, like, um, you know, sometimes my, my, my kids will ask me that, and I, you know, and they well, I think I did okay what do you think? And I'm like, would you like me to answer as your dad or your coach? Because <laughs> those are going to be two different answers. Right? Do you want to feel better right now or you want to be better? Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I also think important thing, and, and Luke, if you want to chime in on this, please do, that, that we, we can't give people confidence. The confidence is earned. Yeah. Confidence comes from confidence. Like we watch Steph Curry making three-pointers and go, oh, Steph, you look really confident out there. No, you look really competent out there, right? And so confidence is earned. Um, I think we can take it away as, ba you know, bad coaching can take it away, bad parenting can take it away, but you can't give people confidence. They have to earn it. No one's going to feel calm. You know, if, I, if I'm not fit and I haven't been practicing, why would I possibly feel confident, right? So I, so I think this is it. But I also think, you know, honesty is important. 
right? And, and so it, it, it's finding those moments of, yeah, you know, I, I don't think as a coach that I, I don't think you, you had a great game. But let's watch the video and we can go through it. Let's see. Any thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, I think we um, do a disservice to athletes when we don't pull the mirror up in yeah. terms of, you know, their goals and their actions on a daily basis. I think that's absolutely, you know, within the realm of, of good parenting to just continually reflect that. Yeah. And when we, when we kind of let that go too long, then they kind of get into that trap of, well, I think I played well when it really was a disaster. You know, and we can kind of be just, just called into accountability more often. There's nothing, nothing out of bounds there from a parent standpoint. Yeah. And then I think, right, it, it, because, like, as an athlete, like, I always, my, I mean, my relationship with my dad wasn't always great, but he was always honest. So if he said I did well, I, I knew I did well. And I used to hate coaches who were like, oh, great game, and I knew I didn't have a good game. Like, that would drive me crazy, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's an important, important thing. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, that, so when you do a TED Talk, they, they say to you, like, what's your idea worth sharing? And, um, and, and so my idea worth sharing when I did the TED Talk was basically around this idea of just, you know, at, after, Anything that your kids do, just tell them I love watching you play. I love watching you compete, right? And it's funny, I get so much feedback from this from people who are like, yeah, I thought that was kind of dumb. And then you start <laughs> doing it, and it's really impactful because it, it frees your kids from the being, you know, feeling responsible for your happiness, right? Um, and then uh, about a year after his death, this um, cool video came out uh, about Kobe Bryant. And uh, this is him talking about um, uh, his, uh, his death. So I think if we take anything from this tonight, just just love our kids, right? As a coach, um, you know, I love you guys no matter what happens today. We've done the right things. We competed hard. Let's go. And, I, and as a parent, I remember when my kids were going to like high school varsity tryouts and they were like nervous. And I was like, whatever happens, I love you guys no matter what, right? So go out there, enjoy it, have fun, right? Compete your best. And I think when when we get that across, then then it becomes theirs, and then they take ownership and. Through ownership and through enjoyment, that's where intrinsic motivation comes from, right? And and without that, they never develop mastery, right? And so, I think the scariest thing, like I said, having gone through this journey now and watched my kids over many years, is that sort of you know how do you release the tether a little bit? How do you let them pull away? Um, recognizing situations is this difficult where they need to fail and struggle and face adversity and get through this or is this dangerous where I need to intervene and save them from an abusive coach or a really toxic situation and it's a gray area it's not perfect I can't ever say oh yeah this is the time um, and sometimes you question yourself and is this going to be okay can can Kid, is my kid in a place to do this? But I think the more reps of that difficulty they get, the the more resilient and strong they, they become as a human being. You know, and that's you. Yeah. I um I really appreciate what you're talking about, and I'm not very uh, I'm not the parent who's like you need to win. Where I where I tend to be focused on is are you pre preparing yourself well? Are you going to sleep? Are you eating right? Are you doing your best? <laughs> right. And so I get, I'm curious about um, how you counsel parents around how how they how they talk to their kids around that, mm -hmm. and like where like where the should 
not should, but should there be like a, a firmness around, hey, it's not necessarily how you end up, it's more, are you taking the steps to prepare? And like, I don't wanna, is it like, how tough are you, do we need to be as parents to, to be looking at those components versus the end product? Do you know yeah. what I mean by No, that? I, I know exactly what you mean. And I think there's sort of two ways I wanna answer that. Like number one, what we, what we teach the teams we work with is we don't ever talk about showing up to win, we talk about showing up to compete, mm -hmm. right? Show up to compete. You can't teach winning. If you teach winning, everyone would do it. You can teach competing. Competing is what are all the things that I control? So if I focus on the things I control, like that I sleep well, that I eat well, uh, what are the things I control in this game? I can dive for loose balls, I can do this, I can, whatever the sport, there's things that belong to you. And there's things that are out of your control, like officials or referees or judges or, or weather or opponents or things like that. You can't control those things, right? And so if you're focused on them, you're never gonna feel confident. You know, so focus on the things and do all the little things brilliantly. That's what we talk to our teams, right? I have a couple of, I have three teams that I'm working with this fall, three college teams. Uh, one of them is the only undefeated Division I field hockey team in the country. We've never once talked about winning, right? We're new, we've never once talked about winning. We talk about competing. How do we compete and how do we love each other so much that our team spirit pulls us through, right? Another one's uh, NESCAC women's soccer team. Um, new coach came into the school and said, you know, I need to change the culture of this team. None of the seniors have ever won a, a, a conference game before. And, uh, and you know, we, we won our first the other day. Like the celebrate, it was like we won the World Cup. It was awesome, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, and then I have a men's soccer team and, and whatever, and it's, it's the same thing. And so I, so I think that's a big part of it, right? And then number two, as a parent, as our kids grow up, and I don't know what age your kids are, Right, like I think when our kids are really young, like, you know, for me personally as a parent, right, yeah, I know you want to eat pizza every day, but uh, you also have to eat vegetables. I'm the adult in the room, right? And so, um, but that was kind of our philosophy growing up, like, because I'm the cook in my family, I don't cook two dinners. <laughs> cook one. You don't want to eat, you're not going to starve to death, right? Um, so, so that was my philosophy there. But like, um, but then how do you let it go? And you know it's not going down the right path, but you're like, but the lesson has to be learned somehow. And they're gonna learn it someday, and maybe they need to learn it well at least up here to supervise. So so perfect example, my, my daughter who is just the kid who says yes to everything. I mean she had like a goal list for the summer and it said say yes to everything and she did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my wife and I are like, you know, Maggie, you gotta like you gotta slow down, you gotta sleep, you gotta college applications and she's doing an IB diploma and she's trying to play sports and like Maggie slow down, Maggie slow down, Maggie slow down. Got it, got it, got it. Well guess who got mono in September? <laughs> right? You know, and it's like, you know, I'm like uh, you know, and then, you know, she was just devastated. But lesson learned. <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> right. Name mom and dad aren't so dumb. Right? So yeah, so I think you that's the heart, right? When do I say no because I'm putting my foot down, right? And when do I say, well, this is going to be a teachable moment if, if, if you don't listen to your body, listen to your mind, listen to your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is all my information. I'll kind of bring it to a close. Give you more questions then. That's my email. I did put, you can look for me on LinkedIn. Like, I don't, like, other social media I hate. So you can follow me there. I'm not going to follow you back. <laughs> but if you like LinkedIn, find me. It's Coach John Masolo on LinkedIn. I've got to put it up there. Um, and um, it's actually a reasonable place to come for people. <laughs> Our podcast, The Way of Champions. Um, now, I do have some books here. Um, and every time I come here, my friend Jules in the background here, I don't know, how many of you had your kids teach, taught middle school Spanish by <laughs> 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 So anyway, um, you know, if you know Julie and everything her family's been through, and they have a scholarship fund for their son, uh, all the proceeds from all these books, their twenty dollars a book is going to the scholarship fund every penny. So I hope at the end of this trip we're going to raise eight hundred thousand dollars for that. So if you want a book, I'll sign it for you. Uh, you can hawk it on eBay tomorrow and make money. On it. <laughs> um, 
But um, yeah, uh, so we have three books. Change the Game is a lot of what we talked about tonight. Every Moment Matters is really focused on coaches. And this one's brand new that Jerry and I did together. It's called The Champion Teammate. And basically, this is written for like high school and middle school kids. It's like three page chapters on how to compete, how to connect, and how to lead. And we have tons of teams that got it for just this fall. They do it as book read. We have college teams winning their conferences. We have high school teams are like, it's changed the culture. Um, and, uh, and so, the, you know, our idea is like, you're going to be part of teams your whole life, right? Your family, your work team, whatever. Why don't we teach kids to be great teammates? And so that's what that's about as well. So I have a couple of those, and they're all on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that fun stuff as well. Uh, two of them are on Audible, not the champion teammate yet, because I swore I'd never record one of my own books ever again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. <laughs> but questions? If anyone has any other questions? What's the biggest takeaway that you want us as parents to take away? Um, I think the biggest takeaway would be this. Your, your kids, you live in this extraordinary place with all these amazing opportunities. And there's so many great coaches in the soccer club and, and skiing and all these things. Think of yourself as the general contractor, right? You're the only one who knows everything your kid's doing. As the soccer coach, I see your kid five hours a week or six hours a week. They come to me, I don't know what's going on in their life. I don't know if they're tired. I don't know that they went to swimming this morning and then piano lessons and then soccer. And then there used to be this part of their day where they were had free time called dinner, but now that's gone and they eat the car. <laughs> I mean, right? you're, this is true. Like yes. most of these yes. people here, yes. is what, that's what this, this real is life, life is. Yeah. So you are the general contractor and you sometimes just like the politics, you have to learn how to say no, right? How do we say no to different opportunities or things, even though they're great, right? That you have a right as a parent to say, that's great that you have all these things, but we also, I would like a life <laughs> and our family, you know, that within the values. So what is the purpose of sport in the lives of your kids? And then try to put them in uh, organizations like this and others that support that mission and that value. And then think of sport, right? Like your kids can ski their whole life. They can swim their whole life. They can run their whole life. We put so much emphasis on these early years, but this is just a slice in a 60 year journey. And if you think about it that way, sometimes you really take the long view and we get a little less excited about the ups and downs in the short term. That's an awesome question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned culture a couple times. Do you have um, three specific resources and you think of the parents who are saying they have great culture that they can work as? Yeah, um, like for your own kid or for? Well, like you mentioned before, right, how teams, the individual sport teams, they function a little different than, than teams where like it's like a lacrosse team or they have to work together. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any more sort of pointers in that direction. Yeah, I, I mean, I really think like the champion teammate book, regardless of, of really sport, like we work with college tennis teams. And what's amazing is like they get to this college tennis, and tennis kids, I don't know if anyone has tennis kids, like they so often grow up just with them and their coach and whatever, and they've never been part of a team. And then they get to sometimes a high school team, like, oh, this is fun, this is cool. But they get to college, and the coaches who create an amazing team and culture know it's a competitive advantage, right? They, they, it's a competitive advantage uh, because kids are like, wow, I, I feel belonging. I feel things that I haven't. I'm not on an island. I have people who have my back when I don't have a good match or whatever. So, yeah, I, I, that book has, like, a whole thing on how we can connect better. Um, and, yeah, we have a lot of individual sport teams. Um, reading it and saying, oh, this is this has been a big difference maker for us. Because again, culture matters in practice, culture matters on the pool deck, culture matters in all these places. Yeah. yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you all so very, very much. Uh, I'll, books, I'll sign them for you here if you want them. I can do Venmo, I can do cash. Um, no more Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs>